Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone is great and energized and looking forward to the session. After a few rainy days here in Bucharest, we have sunny weather, so which is great. So thank you for joining us today. Today we talk data science in healthcare. Data science is at core of every industry, but it has revolutionized healthcare. And healthcare sector is one of the most strategic and important one. But why is that? Data science in healthcare can save lives. Data science in healthcare can save time. And data science in healthcare can change destinies. So predictive medicine, genetics and genomics, how data science is changing healthcare, what we have today and what's next for data science in healthcare, how data prevents or decreases the number of diagnostic errors, and many more we will discuss today. Therefore, I'm welcoming our amazing speakers, senior lecturer Andrei Onus Damian, data scientist, chief researcher officer at Lumetri AI, and Beatrice Minik, 360 think tank data science strategist with high expertise on biomedical engineering. We'll walk you through with real examples on what data science impact on medicine we have today. So I'm welcoming also our special guest, Bogdan Ivano, CEO Janet X and CIO NutriCare Life, coming from Innovix Becere. But before I um, give the word to Mr. Ivanov, I would like to thank Becere and thank Becere Innovix for being our strategic partner for data science meetup series, and also for being one of the major players in Romania that constantly drives innovation. Uh, dear all, uh, if you have any questions at all, please post them in the chat because we will answer them one by one during our Q&A session. So personally, I'm very excited about the session and looking forward to it. Uh, so Bogdan, Bogdan Ivanov, you have the word. Thank you and good morning, everybody. I'm uh, very pleased to, to present and share with you my experience in, in the field of precision nutrition, precision medicine. And uh, I need to share my, my, my small presentation, only one moment to, to, to do it. Uh, we, you need to, to make me a host, please, to be able to, to share the screen. Just a second. And Andy, I will be able to, to share the screen. Uh, I can uh, provide you some background about uh, myself. I'm a former engineer, scientist, and uh, in the last years, I um, uh, was extremely focused on, on the areas of precision medicine and uh, nutrition. We are able to, to do today a lot, a lot of uh, improvements in, in, uh, in treatments and in prevention. Uh, knowing a lot of uh, data. So uh, uh, being in this position and uh, be able to, to know a lot, a lot of uh, data from, from our patient, we, we are able to, to find proper solutions. We are able to, to identify a specific treatment uh, to be able to be more efficient. And I will do the, the sharing now. So yes, you know, everybody uh, is different. So we, we are different and uh, uh, for sure, uh, it's extremely important to identify from where our difference come. So we are impacted by a lot of factors, but mainly uh, we are impacted by what we eat and uh, we are impacted by the genetics, what you inherited and uh, finally, uh, you are impacted by, by the environment. So for this reason, we are different and we react different. We, we react different to drugs. We have different nutritional needs and uh, these factors need to be taken in consideration. Why? Because one in five uh, of us will die sooner because of poor nutrition. And if we uh, develop a disease Unfortunately, today uh, we have uh, not so many chances to, to solve it if we do not have a personalized approach. If you see here in the cancer uh, patient example, uh, if we give them a, a specific treatment with a single drug, a single class action, 
uh, we have a high percentage of inefficient drugs, 75%. So it's important to know exactly how our body reacts to drugs and what nutrients do you need and so on. This the, these are data who should be used in the future. So we are, we are able today because we, we have this data to have a, a, a very efficient uh, um, approach in prevention, in treatment and so on. Why? Because in the last decade, the, the price of uh, genetic uh, sequencing dropped a lot from almost $1 million, it came to under $1,000. So we are able to extract extremely valuable information from our genetics. So we are doing here and we start to, to use it. We look on, on whole genome, we have 22,000 genes. And until today, the scientists discover that around 5,500 genes are medical relevant. So we understand their actions and we can take decisions. And from this 5,000, 1,500 have clinic, they are clinical actionable, meaning that we we know exactly what should do what we should do. If we, a person have a specific genetic variance, we can react and we can act accordingly to to prove to provide the proper uh, treatment. Another important area is gut microbiome. We have a lot, a lot of microbes on our body, and knowing all this data, and knowing how to interpret this data. It's extremely important. So we, we can do a lot of things with, with this enormous uh, quantities of data if we can interpret it. Today, there are labs who are able to interpret this data and they can provide to you a lot of valuable information to be able to, to take decision about your health. If you look today on, on traditional medicine, you, you can you can find uh, a solution who are very common. If you have a uh, unfortunately, cancer disease. You will you will receive uh, maybe a radiotherapy, a radiation, or a, chemi a chemical therapy, and finally you will have a surgery. This is the traditional way of uh, doing medicine today. But knowing all this data about the genome, about the microbiome, about your about your your individuality, you can leverage this data, and you can. Uh, you will know if you have the genetic profile, you, you can identify uh, from the causes of your disease. And if you know your, your other data, relevant data, and, you have, and we have a lot of biological markers who can be interpreted today, we can, we can target the immunodepressive uh, uh, treatment to, to be able to decrease the, the, the cancer effects. And uh, we can do a personalized treatment to, to improve your health. This is the way of precision medicine. And only on the last, maybe you can go to, to, to traditional medicine. Yeah, today uh, we, we are here and uh, we are able to provide pharmacogenetic testing, which uh, help our uh, partners who are uh, specialists, medical specialists, uh, to identify how we react to drugs. We have nutrigenetic testing who, who provide the exact quantities of nutrients to cover all your nutrition deficiencies and many other type of tests. There are labs who are able to, to diagnose, uh, to, to give you the diagnostic based on, on your genetic background. So we are here to, to implement precision in nutrition and precision in medicine. This is my short presentation. Thank you very much, Bogdan. Indeed, genetics plays a major role and data science definitely is in high collaboration with it. So uh, Beatriz and Andre, you have the word. Thank you. Thank you too, Mariana. Um, hi, everyone. I'm very pleased to be today here with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ivanov, for the great presentation. I think it's very important to know that we can draw actionable insights based on genomics data, which can uh, greatly impact our lives. Um, the way I structured uh, our meetup session today is in two parts. The first will outflow around ideas together with Professor Damian. 
And in the second, we'll be happy to pick up all of the questions that we get from the audience. And I'll start with something very trivial. Uh, why did I, data science, Professor Damian? And additionally, I think it would also make sense to give a definition of what data science is. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, this invitation. Um, Actually, I'm pleased to talk about this subject. I'm uh, generally pleased to talk about data science, but in particular, I'm, I'm very happy when I can talk about data science in, uh, in healthcare. Um, so basically, uh, the, the term of data science, I think, was coined just a few years back. So if we go 10 years ago, we didn't have uh, data science. Um, uh, as well as we didn't have deep learning, for example, another very important term that is closely related to what data science means in our days. So basically, it all comes from, and it all starts from biostatistics, uh, which basically is the science of analyzing relevant and st important, statistically important information about natural phenomena and. Probably the most important area of biostatistics being that of, of medicine, of healthcare, and uh, public health, uh, also in particular. So, data science basically, it's uh, you can you can see it as a combination of uh, statistics uh, with, of course, its uh, a big mathematical background with. Uh, a good understanding of the domain that we are using data science on. So basically you cannot do data science in healthcare if you don't have a minimal knowledge on the subject that you are analyzing as well as in any other uh, area. You don't, have a, you don't have to be a specialist in that field. You just need to understand the phenomenon at the basic level so you can uh, have a look on, on, the, on the data. And uh, probably the third and uh, the least important component is the computer science component of data science. Uh, a lot of people think that the data science is the most important component. However, it is not the most important component. I myself, I'm a, I'm a computer scientist as a background, and I can tell you that uh, in data science, the most important is to uh, understand the statistical and the math mathematical modeling of the uh, natural phenomenon that you are analyzing and to understand the intrinsic, uh, intrinsic aspects of the phenomenon. So if we are talking about, let's say, uh, um, healthcare issues or, uh, or public health, you have to understand exactly what you are analyzing. So basically this is a very broad uh, definition of data science and how it relates to healthcare and to our subject. Thank you very much for the great answer. And given your impressive background, I think it will also make sense for you to share with us what motivates you or drives innovation in your job. Okay, so uh, what motivates me and drives innovation? Mm -hmm. um, well, um, you know, you cannot do data science in uh, just any field uh, possible. Um, when, when you start, uh, if, if let's, let me give you a, a very simple example. Um, uh, a few years ago, uh, a company that actually, I think they are doing periodically uh, analysis of the market of the workforce market for data scientists. And they discovered that uh, probably um, more than 50% of the data scientists are not computer scientists at origin. So basically they discovered they have a lot of people that have uh, been doing uh, medical training. Uh, they are physicians actually. Uh, so we have physicians, we have a lot of uh, statisticians, we have artists. So basically for all those people, um, the, the main driving, um, let's say, um, force that um, had them on the data science path was to better understand what they are doing, to better understand uh, um, the actual phenomenon that they were, they were working with. And for this, they, of course, they need, uh, you know, the statistical analysis of the phenomena that they are using and the computer science tools 
um, that can help them model potential outcomes and infer or predict uh, ones out of data. So as you mentioned, uh, there's not a rule when it comes to the background of people who work in data science, but some people still say that data science could play, uh, I don't know, a more critical role in healthcare than in other industries, such as the finance or insurance or you name it. Do you agree with that? Yeah, well, um, like, I, like I said at the beginning, uh, if I, for my, from my personal and own view, I think uh, biostatistics is the uh, um, father of data science. And if we look at the bio, at biostatistics, biostatistics in general uh, deals with analysis of uh, of human uh, uh, natural behavior. So it's it applies to uh, public health. It applies to healthcare in in general. Uh, so um, uh, I don't know. Um, on the other hand, um, if if you look at the impact of, of data science of, or any other uh, important technological tool in, in, uh, in two different uh, areas such as healthcare and banking. Of course, you have to, uh, to, 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 to understand what motivates the people that are employing data science in those fields. So it's kind of hard to imagine somebody being motivated to use data science in banking industry or in, uh, I don't know, financial industry in general um, with totally, um, I don't know, uh, open-ended and, uh, um, you know, it's kind of hard to see people helping other people uh, using data science in finance. For example, on, on stock exchange systems or uh, banking systems. However, if you use and if you aim of, on using data science in healthcare, uh, certainly you can you can find a way to, to help people uh, indiv from individuals to, to large masses. So I think helping people helping people is one of the main drivers that that uh, that helps people go on the path of data science and particularly in healthcare, in public health or all healthcare in general. Thank you very much. And thank you for answering one question in advance actually, because I was about to ask what do you think is the driving component in data science in healthcare? But yeah, I also think it's the human factor and the difference that we can make in the lives of other people. But um, at the same time, we can see that innovation is halted at times and progress is rather slow, I would say. What do you think is, is causing this? I think there are some factors that are causing innovation to be slow at the moment. Could you name a few, please, or share your, your experience? Yeah, well, um, I think there are multiple factors that uh, are affect affecting innovation and probably one of them and the most uh, uh, generic and reasonable one is that the human nature, you know? So um, I, th I think um, people tend to, 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 um, to start, you know, super hyped subject, subjects and, and they start investing a lot of um, imagination and a lot of um, wrong expectations in that particular field. And this is what actually happened with artificial intelligence and data science in particular a few years ago. And I think that hype, it somehow slowed down. So we are on, uh, on a descending, uh, descending um, um, slope of the hype, uh, how, how Gunner calls it, the technology hype or the um, uh, subject hype. So basically, I think uh, we we are we are slowly going through towards uh, a a more realistic view on on this subject, and uh, in the same time, I think we are starting to slow uh, slowly uh, understand what data science can do to our uh, to our lives, to our workplaces, uh, how data science can improve. Um, I don't know patients uh, for if I, we're talking about healthcare, but patients, the health uh, caretaking, and how realistically data science can improve 
the quality of life. So basically, uh, th this leads me to, to the second uh, and probably most important aspect related to data, data science in healthcare and to innovation in this field, uh, healthcare data science, which is adoption. So probably adoption is one of the most important uh, things. We still have, uh, and um, when, I, when, we, when I say we, we still have, I'm not talking about uh, Romania or Eastern Europe or Europe, I'm talking about worldwide in general. We still have a lot of reluctancy when it comes to employing data science tools in healthcare. We still have problems, a lot of problems, uh, when it comes to uh, using uh, artificial intelligence tools such as, I don't know, uh, deep learning based computer vision systems to help us or to give us second opinions in radiology tasks or, or uh, things like that. So I, I would limit myself to those two particular aspects, human nature and reluctancy on, on using new technology when it comes to uh, what, what stops us in, in the way of improving and innovating. Thank you very much. These are, I would say, societal sociate, factors. But when it comes to the actual problems, uh, would you consider access to data to be a big problem? How can you use the patient's data under without infringing on privacy regulations such as GDPR, for instance. Okay, okay. So this is a very um, hot topic, especially in Europe. Um, so basically this leads, leads me to another answer for a question that has been asked yet, uh, which is what, what is the main driving force of data science and artificial intelligence in the last years? So uh, all the technologies that we're using now are based on mathematical models that have been on, um, I don't know, out there, uh, maybe uh, for the last 50 years or for the last 30 years. What, but what really um, has driven the investment in data science is the um, availability of data. So availability of data in a lot of fields, such as uh, computer vision, such as, uh, auto, um, and its subdomains, uh, such as autonomous car driving or uh, other computer vision related subjects, the amount of data that appeared uh, and it's uh, publicly available at this moment, it's huge in comparison to what we had let's say even 15 years ago. However, in healthcare industry, things are totally different. I'm, I'm gonna give you just an ex a simple example. So if we are talking about uh, a database of images that can help an artificial intelligence system to, uh, I don't know, let's say drive a car, okay? So you would like to build a self-autonomous driving system and uh, you have the uh, data science, the mathematical, the computer science no knowledge required for this. Uh, and what you need to do is to acquire data, as you said, uh, in order to train your artificial intelligence. So uh, basically that means movies of streets, uh, pictures from the streets and, and, and so on. At this particular moment in time, you can acquire billions of images, billions of observations related to this particular subject. However, on the other hand, if you would like to uh, develop a system that, let's say, uh, tries to ad identify uh, skin lesions, for example, uh, so a computer system based on the artificial intelligence that has to train on um, previously identified by clinicians of uh, skin lesions, or and ju just another example, uh, if you like to develop a, a system that helps in the process of, um, let's say, uh, cervical cancer screening, just, just as an example, so uh, again, you need uh, example of, of, of lesions, uh, pictures of lesions. So you can give them to the AI system, the AI system train itself, and then it can identify potential lesions on the new cases. So if you want to, to, to just to build one of these two applications, you might find uh, after a few weeks of hard work, uh, find maybe, I don't know, 
a few tens of thousands of images out there on on the wide uh, in 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 the wide in the on in in open source and public uh, public uh, open publicly opened databases and this is nothing totally nothing compare in comparison with other fields where you have billions of observations you have billions of pictures that can that I, ai can use so this is a big, a big issue and uh, uh, probably one of the uh, main, um, how, can I, how can I say it? One of the biggest problem is that uh, regulators don't understand how systems work. Regulators don't understand the reality of confidentiality, of data confidentiality when it comes to artificial intelligence uh, machine learning, deep learning, related to the field of healthcare. Definitely, but at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking that the regulations too do not define what exactly is anonymous data. There's a very gray zone. And the reason why I'm, I know this fact, fact is because I work for a data privacy company based in Berlin, who is offering data anonymization software by means of generating synthetic data. And with regard uh, to what you just mentioned, I think when you are uh, working on images, it's easier given also that the current technology allows you to generate synthetic images or videos to train models on. But the problem comes as you also highlighted when you have to actually detect some outliers to say so. Like it happens in the case of, I don't know, financial fraud or some exotic disease or something like this that you don't have a lot of data to train your models on okay this is a very interesting topic uh that um let's say data driven machine learning based on either augmenting or creating new observation new data out of nothing however um this uh, you know this particular uh area is not very well suited for healthcare industry so uh, like let's let's let me give you a few examples. You can generate uh, images of uh, dogs crossing the street. You can generate images of um, crossroads. Uh, you can generate images of semaphores, of cars, of people walking on the street, and and so on. However, and you can of course give those images to uh, other models that have to recognize and have to, I don't know, calculate distance from the point of view to that particular point and help an autonomous driving system, for example, or other applications. However, when it comes to uh, identifying a lesion uh, on, um, on a skin surface, for example, or uh, just, uh, um, I, I will just connect to the Sec the, the first and the second example I just previously gave, uh, or uh, when you have to uh, analyze uh, um, a cervix, um, a picture of um, required for um, cervical can cancer diagnosis, uh, it's kind of complicated to generate images because you need very accurate very detailed information of that formation. You don't need a general, um, how can I say, um, a general view of, of the object, like a human crossing a street. You need specific information at the level of pixels, at the level of points in the radiography. So it's a lot more complicated and difficult to generate artificial data or even augment data. So when you augment data in um, for autonomous driving, driving, you can go nuts with whatever uh, effects you want to, to play with. However, when you, when you augment data for healthcare, you have to be very careful and to replicate uh, specific, um, how, how should I say it, conditions that can happen in real life, such as rotating the, the camera a little bit, I don't know, uh, changing the light, or a different tone of the skin from that person, uh, no matter where, where that skin comes from and, and, and so on. And uh, probably the most, again, the most important thing is that uh, the regulators don't understand uh, the difference between um, identifying a person or reconstructing the information 
from an artificial in, uh, intelligence system and using anonymous data. So you, you can, in, in healthcare in particular, you can take the data from the patient, you can, and you can use it totally anonymously. However, this is still a very, very um, sensitive subject, especially in Europe. Definitely. And if, if, you, if they allow you to use it, they ask you to strip off a lot of columns in the data set or to delete it after a specific period of time, which means that you cannot run long-term analysis on the data that you have at hand, which is painful, especially in the uh, case of trying to track the patient journey, for instance. You, this is a use case you mentioned earlier. Oh, wait, okay. So if we are talking about computer vision, uh, we, we still might have a chance to, to use publicly available data and push regulators, understand how computer vision systems and understand that it's almost impossible to um, reconstruct the identity of a person based on a very small patch of skin where uh, a lesion has been uh, photographed and analyzed by a computer vision artificial intelligence system. However, if we are talking about structured data where you have patient record information, history, track record and so on, then it's a totally different story. And at this point, uh, we go from um, uh, lack of understanding and, uh, and probably uh, being just um, paranoid and suspicious uh, which is the case of, of computer vision systems, to totally denial of service and, uh, uh, you know, holding that data. And there are a lot of cases where this is totally reasonable. So uh, personal information shouldn't be uh, kept by the artificial However, there are cases where personal information can be tracked back to the um, uh, original owner of that data without having specific uh, patient information. So this is possible. So it is a matter of concern. It's not just uh, uh, you know, uh, paranoia, let's say, as in the case of, of computer vision where you just have a small patch of skin. Yeah, there are famous cases of such privacy breaches to say so. They combine secondary sources of data and they obtain the full view on the patients. Anyways, I think that's enough about privacy. I would like to learn what you consider the biggest breakthroughs in healthcare for the last couple of years, or even within a larger time frame, which concern data science, of course. Okay, I, in my opinion, uh, I don't say uh, in, let's say in last uh, 12 months or 24 months, uh, a huge breakthrough. However, what I'm um, happy about, let's say, is that the fact that uh, in the last three years, uh, I've seen uh, um, a slow shift from, from a unrealistic view on what AI and data science can do in data in, in healthcare to a more realistic view. And uh, I see a shift from an unfocused view of AI tools that can help healthcare to a more focused view of how AI can, can, can help uh, healthcare. And um, I, I think we have uh, um, a few infographs on, with the, regard to this subject. Maybe you can share yeah. them. Do you, can you share them, Mariana, or should I? The infographs. If you can share them, Beatrice, let me know if it works. Thank you. Yeah, of course. If it doesn't, I, okay, okay, perfect. Okay, okay, excellent. Maybe if you just uh, put it on full screen, excellent. So basically, uh, this is uh, from 2017-18, so it's very, very uh, close past. And this is analysis done by Accenture and Harvard uh, Business Review. And uh, they were trying to, to identify the top 10 uh, potential AI application that could change and that could revolutionize healthcare. And uh, if you look at this particular, uh, I, I highlight, highlighted actually four different areas, but let me give you uh, uh, a general uh, view. Basically, we have here a 
totally unfocused and uh, broad view from cybersecurity that basically doesn't have much to do with healthcare is is only indirectly of course to uh, to sci-fi and totally um, and probably partially unrealistic um, approaches such as robot assisted surgery uh, and i have to make, have a very uh, clear mention in regard in this subject uh, um, extending the arm of the surgeon with a robotic arm, it's a breakthrough and it's, a, uh, um, it's more than a good thing. It's something that um, uh, changes the game in, in surgery. Um, however, when we are talking to robotic, assist, robotic assistive surgery, and uh, if we are talking about artificial intelligence, then uh, that's something else. Artificial intelligence meaning means um, uh, the actual robot has uh, uh, his uh, its own thoughts, its own um, uh, let's say um, learned uh, procedures, and it assists assists the surgeon. It should assist in theory the, the surgeon as a uh, um, you know as a artificial as a, a virtual surgeon. So um, this is um, somehow un unrealistic at this particular moment. Uh, on the other hand, um, I'm not going, I, I just wanted to, to give you the, the, the most important application that they, they coined at that moment and the, the, probably the least and the most unrelated to the healthcare industry. However, there are four different areas so you have, you, you see here dosage error reduction, clinical trial, preliminary diagnosis, automated image diagnosis. Those are areas that are very close related to something that in the, in the past two years, uh, it's becoming more and more ma mainstream in data science applied to healthcare industry. And that is uh, primary, uh, secondary and uh, ter tertiary prophylaxis prevention. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this is a, um, a, let's say a newer view. Uh, I just shared here uh, one of the, uh, an infograph done by one company that it, it's act, uh, active in, the, in this field. So basically, uh, if we go fast forward two years from that 17, 18 uh, period, uh, we see more focus. So, uh, um, Companies and opinions are more focused on uh, prevention, on early detection, on diagnosis. So we are talking about things that can actually be achieved by artificial intelligence. So in, let's cut it short and move to the, to the last one. Okay, so basically this is um, my and my colleagues own view of the reality for the short and medium future. So basically the focus uh, in, in a lot of, uh, for a lot of startups, for a lot of uh, universities, and uh, I think it should, should be um, uh, adopted by uh, other players is on, on prophylaxis and on primary, secondary, and tertiary. And I can give you just a, a few examples. In primary uh, prophylaxis, uh, you can have virtual assistants that um, it can uh, guide you to a better lifestyle. And um, I think uh, uh, what Mr. In Ivanov showed us is uh, it's, uh, if with, with his permission, I, I could say that it's, a, it's an example of primary prophylaxy. Um, and of course, uh, also in primary prophylaxy, we can have more advanced approaches and such as predictive models that, that uh, um, give us prognosis of future outcomes of our health status if we don't uh, follow a certain path. On secondary prophylaxis, probably we have more meat. It's, it's probably more important, uh, especially in, in countries such as uh, Romania or other Eastern uh, countries, and even more important in countries where uh, the healthcare, um, public healthcare, it's, uh, it's much, much slower and has a lower impact where you can use automated uh, procedures such as um, smart um, uh, devices, uh, medical devices that can identify um, 
lesions in in uh, on field if, in, during the, the screening uh, procedures for various diseases uh, and especially for chronic ones. And of course, you can uh, you can using data science you can model strategy and you can pinpoint future. Uh, um, uh, areas that need special attention in, in secondary prophylaxy uh, procedures. And the last but not least is the, uh, the tertiary uh, prevention area where you can uh, help uh, with the aid of uh, intelligent um, and AI based with machine learning and deep learning uh, predictive and inferential systems. You can help patients with long-term uh, problems. And uh, of course, you can also predict, I don't know, such uh, things like crises or resurgences in, um, in chronic diseases before they actually happen. So I think the focus in, in prophylaxy, I, I would call is the, the main uh, advance in, in a couple of years. I couldn't pinpoint on a particular technology or a particular, I don't know, deep learning or data science achievement that uh, totally revolutionizes uh, uh, healthcare industry. Thank you very much. So you answered another question in advance because I was about to ask what transformation you cha or change you see coming from data science in the last, in the next five to 10 years. But if there's no, particular use case that you would like to focus on, I'll move on. Yeah, I, I think what, what uh, it's very important is that we are slowly moving to the realistic stage of the data science and artificial intelligence hype. So I think we, we passed over the, the first peak and the most dangerous one where um, everybody talks about artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence and uh, it's the best or the robot will take over the world and Skynet from Terminator will, uh, will lock down our computers and make, uh, make um, us prisoners or uh, I don't know, slaves to the computer. So we, I think we passed that point in, in, in my opinion. And we are uh, somehow in a, in, a, uh, in a bottom of that particular graph of, uh, of hype evolution. And we are slowly moving to a, a realistic view of what artificial intelligence can do and how artificial intelligence can be employed in our lives. But let's imagine the world in 2030. Um, I don't want to make, to build this scenario in your heads, but at the same time, let's say we have, we are dealing with another pandemic do you think data science would be able to predict that so that authorities can come up with a prevention plan or stricter measures right from the beginning? Uh, well, I'm very optimistic on this subject, actually. I'm um, probably too optimistic, uh, but I have, a, you know, I have some data uh, uh, that helps me uh, with this op optimistic view. Uh, and that uh, it's related to the fact that even uh, COVID-19 uh, has been actually uh, predicted by, by a company that does data science and does deep learning uh, somewhere in Canada. So basically uh, they, they, they pinpointed the future outbreak before it happened. So I'm, and, and that happened, uh, you know, uh, uh, using a system that uh, I, if I recall correctly, that analyzed um, text from chats, from, uh, from social media, and uh, it discovered, it, it predicted that in a particular area of China, there will be an outbreak in, uh, I don't know, in a few weeks. So they actually did that and they published the information and, and this is totally traceable. It's not, it's not fictional, it's, it's reality. So if, if we could do that at that moment and, uh, and th there wasn't, uh, you know, such as a clear danger as it is right now, a new pandemic and a new problem, I think more and more uh, regulators and financial uh, uh, institutions that can financially aid research in this area 
will get involved in, in this uh, um, capability of predicting uh, future uh, events, future dramatic events based on artificial intelligence. And I think uh, probably in, in a three to five years, we will have um, more smarter and smarter systems that will be able to predict such um, disastrous uh, events. And by uh, 2030, I don't know, maybe by then we will have uh, the singularity and we will have uh, uh, artificial generic uh, intelligence, general intelligence. And uh, it will be uh, benefic, it will not be malevolent and it will help us. Indeed, yes, this is a great question we are faced with. But anyways, um, I can see that at a European level, AI and its applications are still not fully accepted by the, the larger public. Do you think authorities are ready to, to embrace these novel technologies? I think this is a great question that we need to have answered. Because no matter how fast technology evolves, if we're not able to implement it for, to make a difference um, at a bigger level, then is it really worth it? Okay. Um, so basically there is a big gap between Europe and uh, China and United States. Let's, let's divide, let's simplify things and divide the world in, in three points, United States, China, and Europe. And there is a big gap in accepting, in financing, in, in promoting and in, um, uh, in, in general, in promoting uh, science and research and innovation in this area. And uh, uh, this, this uh, gap is clearly visible in, uh, in what technologies and what patents and uh, in what products and innovation are coming out of Europe in comparison with the United States or China. And probably one of the most important things is the... Um, the small regulatory mess that uh, Europe uh, is right now uh, in with regard to artificial intelligence in general, and particularly with machine learning and deep learning, you know, techniques that process data and uh, generate uh, statistical models that uh, can uh, prognose, can, can predict or can infer information about patients, about phenomena and, and so on. So uh, even in, in Europe, uh, we have different views for different for the, the, the states that are in uh, in EU, uh, and uh, I don't know. Um, I, I think it, uh, the, the the whole idea of embracing and adopting and pushing innovation limits to in Europe. Uh, for uh, EU started uh, was started by EC, the by European Commission. Uh, I think only three years ago, if I remember correctly, in 2016. So it's not three years ago; it's four years ago, basically. And uh, since then, the whole idea of uh, regulating and uh, putting out good regulations regarding IE has gone very, very slow. So it's very slow in Europe and it's slower in, in a lot of countries of, if, of Europe, especially in Romania. And what do you think would speed up this? Who should be the first to take action in this respect? Like, do the data scientists need to speak up a lot more or who is responsible for this? Okay, I the think- Consumer will a... take action because they will, they will request uh, uh, an improved service and no matter the governments we want or not, the society will ask for performance solutions. So it's clear that the, the innovation will come from the from uh, uh, from any institution who are able to who is able to understand the, the new solutions. So uh, it will be a request from 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 the mass uh, market. So we'll do, we'll have innovation because we will have technology. Government will not uh, 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 put uh, a lot of uh, pressure on developments, but uh, the society will put, and uh, we have a lot of uh, institut institutions and companies who will use the competitive advantage to, to uh, launch new products on the market, and uh, this will be in the future. 
and how you saw on the graph with uh, genetics analysis with sequencing in 10 years from 1 million euro cost of genetic sequencing in only 10 years uh, we have under 1000 dollars this is an impressive uh, uh, success it will be in all domains that's this is my my idea so the government that yeah, they have a, a huge impact but the governments are on the the country level but there are countries who who will who want to to have more success and uh, they will uh, uh, increase the the um, the environment they will uh, create the environment to to facilitate the innovation like developed developed countries in in europe where we can see a lot of patents and so on thank you i have to admit that i i have um, um not such an optimistic view as yourself <laughs> uh, um it's very hard to 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 imagine that um a country where uh mm, you know the it, the governmental investment in innovation and in particular uh, uh, area that we are discussing about uh, let's say data science and artificial intelligence applied to healthcare industry uh, it's very hard to imagine that two different countries uh, one that receives let's say uh, ten dollars per uh, per um, uh, population unit, and another one that receives uh, uh, zero per population or is or one dollar per population unit will have the same impact in in the field. It's very hard to 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 imagine that, and especially when we are not talking about differences such as from one dollar to ten dollars. We are talking about differences from one dollar to uh, $10,000. So uh, the difference, the gap in financing and, and um, research financing, it's huge. It's huge. And I'm not talking about the size of the country. I'm uh, talking statistically at the level of, of uh, um, each, in each country, um, proportional size of the country, not, not overall, not absolute value. I have a point to add to this. It's also the fact that uh, richer countries develop the models and then they are democratized and applied on in other countries too, right? And the models are defined by the data they are trained on. That means they are full of biases. If they are trained in a very rich country, you cannot take them uh, to do good in a third world country. So this is a major problem at the moment. The models are not yet there to ge generalize so well, and the data is full of biases, from gender bias to income bias, you name it. And this is a case where, let's say, you, you have publicly available statistical neural models, OK? Uh, so models that uh, have been developed based on deep learning and other machine learning techniques, okay? However, uh, what if we are discussing about models that have been um, developed uh, using uh, governmental financing and they are not publicly available? At that point, the gap and the, uh, it becomes even larger and it's impossible for you to, to get that information, to get that know-how, to, to get that uh, you know, uh, pre-constructed, let's say, statistical uh, neural model and use it in, in your own application, in your own country, in your own company. It's a, it's a black box, actually. So you don't know what exactly you're finding, I guess. I think this also fuels the fears of people, right? Because they don't know what they're dealing with and what data the models were trained on. Okay, this is a, a totally different topic and uh, um, a huge discussion. Uh, that's, that's another problem in, in the era of data science because in data science currently, uh, not currently, from the very beginning of, of this field, there have been two different views and two different, uh, let's say, two different views, it's, it's good enough. One that uh, is from the people who, who believe that everything should be simple, you know, simple statistical models, uh, simple approaches that can be easily explained. 
And uh, one comes from the people that are, let's say, more um, geared towards uh, actual artificial intelligence, uh, you know, constructing machines that really think. And uh, th those are totally the two kind of totally different views because it's, uh, like you said, it's almost impossible to uh, clearly explain what a very complex neural model does in a particular application. So you can explain some uh, particular things to a data scientist from, let's say the data science is that, that provides that, that neural uh, uh, intelligent, let's say, I, should, I wouldn't say intelligent, neural model, okay? Uh, can explain and can help other data scientists understand what actually happens there. But it's almost impossible to, to transfer the knowledge to, to the um, public audience, uh, to a person that doesn't have any formal training in statistics or, or data science in, in general. So uh, we still have this problem about these two different uh, sides that are battling each other. And one is, okay, uh, we are not going to, to, to use very complex things. We should keep it, keep it simple. We should use statistics. We should use a mathic, mathematical models that have been used for the 100 years. And another one that it, it's more focused on uh, constructing real artificial intelligence. I am obviously with the second one. <laughs> And whose responsibility should be to decide this? Like this is a great responsibility, right? Uh, what, what responsibility do you mean, sorry? To, for instance, to address bias and to make sure that your model is, is working in an ethical way. Hmm. Uh, well, this is, um, I think uh, in 2000, uh, 19. 2019 is, is, is probably the year that uh, somehow um, can be seen as the starting point of, uh, or st of strong research in the area of unbiasing uh, artificial intelligence, unbiasing from, uh, you know, from language models uh, up to uh, uh, language models that help you, you know, help a chatbot communicate with the human person up to computer vision systems that, I don't know, uh, uh, detect skin lesions. And um, unbiasing, it's a very, very hot topic and very important subject at this moment. And we, we are still far from solving the problem. So uh, just, I think just two weeks ago, I, I, um, I tried a very simple case of translating from Hungarian language to uh, Romanian language, a few phrases with Google Translate. Google Translate is a, it's a very powerful and very intelligent, I should say, um, application of data science. And it's very up-to-date from the perspective of research and uh, modern technologies. And I didn't like what, what actually happened. I really didn't like what actually happened, meaning that the language model uh, of, uh, from, from Google actually uh, was very biased and was very gender biased. So I'm, I'm, if, if, uh, if you would like to try it, you can do it. If you know Hungarian, you can try to, to, to test it um, and see what happens. This was all over the internet. I think it happened for, not for Hungarian alone, but for many other languages. And, but now the question that I have, and this is also a question that bothers me, um, is, is there a problem with the models or the data? Like Google is, has this problem, not because of the models, but because of the data that it has collected, right? Like a huge amount of data that is very much biased. So yeah. are the models to blame or the data we have actually? There's, I think the problem lies deeper than. Yeah, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, say, okay, it's, uh, um, I think that the answer for the data science scientists is obvious. The, the data is to blame, of course. Uh, however, I wouldn't say uh, 100%. I would say it's 90% uh, data and 10% models. So we are still far from, um, 
from being advanced in the area of, uh, of unbiased, unbiased neur neural uh, modeling and unbiased training of one particular subject, subject in, in deep learning and data science. But again, data is to blame. So if you, if you um, uh, let's say, uh, if you constructed a, a skin lesion data set with, I don't know, 10,000 observations, let's say, uh, for 10 different types of skin lesion uh, based on um, persons that are sampled from uh, China province, let's say, and uh, you try to, to, to run that particular model on people from Uganda, for example, you'll have a lot of mistakes uh, because the, the model is biased on, on Chinese people. So uh, this is a very simple example. And, you know, it's like you, uh, taking a child and, um, and uh, uh, teaching uh, him in a closed environment and putting that, uh, taking the child from that environment and putting uh, him or, or she uh, in, in the open world is the same. We, we have a question here. Uh, once you have a model, you can train it for the third world country. You only need data and pipe it to the model slash algorithm developed somewhere else. Tune it a little bit and you're ready to go. So can you tell us if you agree? Can I see the question again, please? Uh, uh, just yes. to make sure that I've understood it. It's yes, in the chat. It's in actually. the chat in the panelists, yeah. And I think this is not uh, a question per se. I think it's a suggestion to the example that I gave that if you have a model trained in a very rich country, mm -hmm. uh, if you put it to work in a third world country, what would happen? Um, so to give more, more context on this, what I meant is that not you can, the fact that you cannot actually take the model there and that it won't work, um, it will definitely work. Um, the questions that I have are more around social justice and whether the data that we have from, let's say Germany would apply to a country in Africa or something in this in this lines. But Professor Damian, maybe you also have something to add to this. Yeah, unfortunately, I cannot find the, the question, but maybe I'm not looking at the, uh, the right uh, uh, chat area. Please, please. Oh, okay, I found it, I found it. Okay, okay, once you, you have a model, you can train it uh, for the third world country. Once you have a model, you can train it for the, that third, okay. You only need data and pipe it and the model will develop somewhere else to need a bit and you're ready to go. Okay, it depends. So it depends on, on the um, uh, particular, um, let's say data science or let's let, uh, if we are talking about models and pre-trained models, most likely we are talking about deep learning. Okay, so uh, if we are talking about uh, a language model, um, we might have a bit of issues when let's say we train a model on English language or Chinese language only, and then we just try to fine tune it on Romanian. Uh, so we might need not only a bit of data, we need a lot of data to, to tune it and to make it work in Romanian. However, if let's say we are talking about a computer vision uh, system where, um, uh, the, the, root, the root, it's, it's basically the same. We are all humans. We are all, uh, it's, it's a, a bit more simple than in languages. Uh, then you can train the model in, in China, as I, I gave my example. And then you can fine tune it uh, maybe with a smaller amount of data in Uganda and the model will, will work fine. So basically there is no uh, universal answer, it, it only depends, it, it depends on the use case, it depends on the technology, it depends on the particular domain of deep learning that we are, uh, we are approaching. Thank you very much, Professor Damian. I don't know about you, but I, I really enjoyed this conversation. It's, it's very nice to be here with you all today. Um, I will try to end this on a happy note and I hope I can count on you. Do you think data science will help us live longer, happier lives? It's a big promise to make, I know, but. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, I think uh, we are we are closing on uh, with the same um, subject that we started. Uh, Mr. Ivanov, I think, uh, was was the lead in this uh, in this area, and I'm pretty sure that if we focus uh, using data science and deep learning on prophylaxy, on predicting uh, what will happen if we don't uh, do the right things. In, in our life, with our health, uh, with our nutrition, with our medicines, with our workouts, based on the whole information that we can provide the system with, uh, from the genetic information to, uh, I don't know, to the interaction between uh, us and uh, our, uh, our um, relatives, uh, the people that, uh, the country that we are in and, and so on. If we provide all this information and if we focus on constructing uh, data science uh, systems, data science-based systems and artificial intelligence in this era, I'm pretty sure the quality of life uh, of everyone will drastically improve. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will now read some questions that we received from the audience. Um, the first one sounds like this. Has Romania lost the start of being a respected player in the data science field, especially applied in healthcare? Okay, it's actually two questions. <laughs> so if you are asking the first question, I would, I would say no, because um, um, if we are talking about uh, the starting, we are talking about you know, the people that are Romanians and are working in this field and are recognized as such in this field. And a lot of people are working in Google Brain, in uh, I don't know, DeepMind, uh, Facebook uh, research, Microsoft research, and they're Romanians and they, are, they have very good results. And we also have quite a few startups here in Romania in the recent years. And I think uh, we have a good start. Not that great, but we are okay. We are on the on the worldwide map of artificial intelligence and data science. I think, in my opinion. However, in healthcare, I wouldn't say uh, we we have a good start. I wouldn't say that because it's hard to have a good start in an area that has uh, zero to none regulation and zero to none support at the country level. Uh, I'm not talking about, let's say, a group of Romanians that build a startup in UK and this startup uh, aims uh, at aiding the healthcare industry. I'm talking about Romania as a country. Thank you. You mentioned that um, Romanians are, um, are achieving great results and you are one of them in the data science field. But I would like to ask you what your biggest frustration as a data scientist is. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm achieving great results. It's too much. I'm having a lot of fun, and I, I think I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm managing to touch the lives of the people that are uh, using uh, things that come out of my hands. This is very important for me. Um, so, um, I don't know. I, I got a bit, a little bit uh, um, uh, shocked by the, the fact that uh, I'm achieving great results, and I, I don't like to, to say that. So, uh, can can you repeat the question? But that's true. So, I wanted to learn what your biggest frustration working as a data scientist is. Okay. Okay, I, I wouldn't say a frustration, it's a, it's a reality. Um, if it comes to, to frustrating reality is the adoption of our work and the fear of people who don't understand what we do and that fear of black box. You know, you, you said about black box like five minutes ago is the fear of black box. I don't know what it's in there. 
I see it, it generates something interesting, but I'm afraid of it. So this is the, the biggest frustration. And it's not related to the things that I do and I work on, it's related to the way people around and not related directly related to the subject are react, reacting to, to our work and our systems and, and so on. Um, otherwise, in, in terms of uh, working hands-on on data science and artificial intelligence system, Every day, it's it's uh, it's you discover something new, and uh, uh, usually you discover it, uh, you know, uh, either from mistakes or by mistakes. Or uh, so it, I I wouldn't say um, things that bother you are frustrations. More like um, happy events, happy unknown events. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The next question is addressed um, to Mr. Ivanov, and it sounds like this. Having been part of two startups involving healthcare and data science, what has been the main challenge as an entrepreneur? Was it funding? Was it transforming raw research in a working business mode or a proof of concept? Yeah, I think the, the, the most uh, challenging it was to, to develop the product to, to mark to market fit the product. So uh, it was uh, uh, an effort to understand the, the customer needs. And we developed first uh, like an MVP after our uh, ideas. And when we came to the market, we realized that uh, it wasn't okay. So uh, the real life is it's, uh, pretty tough. Uh, you, you work on data science, you do the algorithms, you are, you are dream about your product, but when you are going to to the real life, uh, you you met with with people who have different uh, level of knowledge, and uh, yes, we are going to to medical doctors, to specialists, and um, we expect that uh, they understand. And uh, unfortunately, the majority didn't understand. So this this was the this was the the main uh, uh, challenge we had uh, to. To refine the product to 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 be able to provide what customers request. Definitely, I think this is the biggest challenge for startups, like going to the market with a product, taking it outside of the lab to say so. Yeah, when when you're coming with with uh, with data, with valuable data coming from from research, they are new data, and you are going to on, on the market who are used. To to to, uh, to to use the old uh, solutions like try and error or one size fit all, and you are coming with something new. And uh, when we are going to health area, it's it's extremely difficult to 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 change the way of being, to change the way of treat the, the patient. And uh, you mentioned the regulatory. Yes, uh, they are afraid to change anything because uh, they are not regulated. Uh, you don't have enough uh, clinical studies, uh, uh, real evidence to, to prove it because you are new and you are coming with an in innovation. So it's a big challenge to, to promote your innovation and to, to implement in medical practice uh, the, the real uh, solutions, effective solutions, new solutions. It's, it's okay in the lab, it's okay in, in, uh, in the research facilities, but when you are go to, to the healthcare provider place in the practice, it's a little bit difficult. Thank you very much for your answer. Professor Damian, we have someone completing your answer on the last question. They said frustration in their case is the lack of jobs in data science in Romania. Most of the data scientists in Romania just parse and gather data. So they are a data processor more than. So the question is, it's not a question, it's just uh, an addition to your answer. Yeah, uh, I was joking actually. Uh, so, um, okay, probably the person that uh, wrote that will, will not like my answer. So, um, there is a lot of um, dreaming and uh, pipe dreaming regarding data science. And uh, all aspiring data scientists imagine that when you start on the path of data science, you only, uh, you know, you, you work all day on building a very smart intelligence that one day 
will help us, uh, uh, I don't know, um, construct a, a new world somewhere in the universe or uh, uh, travel through hyperspace or whatever. So it, unfortunately, it's not like that. I mean, data science and uh, even deep learning, if we take deep learning as a sub area of data science, it's, it's, it's simply not like that, especially if you do it in, in real world, in real world cases. It's like, let me give an example. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know, uh, maybe 99% working with data and 1% uh, uh, building that uh, cool, smart, artificial intelligence, uh, neural model, whatever, that uses that data. So this is, uh, it's not a case in Romania. It, it's a case everywhere. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you something uh, interesting and maybe not that interesting for the people who, who know me, uh, uh, both in, in the academia, both in the, the class I teach in data science with deep learning at Polytechnic University, as well as in, uh, in the company I, I, I work for, I, I push very hard people to work on data analysis, on data uh, cleaning, on data understanding. Data understanding, it's, it's in reality, it's more important than building the right model because actually you cannot build the right model. You cannot build the right neural uh, deep learning model without very, very well understanding of the data that you are working for, the working with and that of the natural phenomenon and the use case that you are working for. So I, I don't think they, they, they love my answer, but this is the reality. Thank you very much. There's a question which can be addressed to both you, Professor Damian and uh, Mr. Ivanov. And it sounds like this, what would be your first change in Romania regarding the healthcare system if you would be the Minister of Health? Yes. I'm happy to nice, have both nice question. <laughs> uh, I will try to answer first to give Mr. Damian time to, to find the proper answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, if I will be the Minister of Health, uh, for sure I will, uh, I will uh, invest the few money I have in, in uh, technology, new technologies, because only with new technologies and efficient technologies, we will spend our few money in an efficient way. So I will change a little bit the, the investment uh, areas, not in old and unfashioned equipment who can stay in our uh, healthcare uh, places. Uh, and yeah, this, was, this will be the first change. Okay, uh, Professor Darmian, what would you do if you were the Minister of Health in Romania? What would be the first thing you would do? Uh, first of all, uh, I, would, I would put my resignation because I'm not qualified to be the Minister of Health of Romania. However, if somehow I would be forced to, uh, to do that, um, I, will, I will play the, uh, the role of, the, of a manager. Uh, in in uh, in this area, and I'll use my knowledge in the fields that I, I know. Uh, and probably what I would do, I would uh, find a way to uh, find funding and in and create um, a system, a regulatory system, together with the budgets to to promote investing and innovation in the area of artificial intelligence and. Um, helping uh, and tools based on artificial intelligence uh, that will help us in the primary uh, and secondary uh, prophylaxis in our country. Uh, unfortunately, our country, it's still uh, be, uh, among the, the, the most, the worst cases in EU, EU with regard to chronic diseases such as cervical cancer, for example. I'm not sure, but on the late, latest statistics, I think, uh, we are in the uh, top 10 
mortality rate in, in Europe with regard to this uh, chronic disease. And you have to uh, imagine and you have to uh, uh, be aware that there are some countries where it's almost totally eradicated due to the screening and the vaccination processes. So basically, uh, what would be very important that we would employ artificial intelligence to tell us, and data science, let's, let's not call it artificial intelligence because maybe it's too pretentious, the, the term. Let's call it data science. We should employ data science in order to find the most important points where we, we can pinpoint our intervention and we can uh, screen uh, uh, potential patients, no matter the, the chronic disease. And there we, we should inject the funding and we should inject, the, I don't know, the, the uh, finding required for, for the actual screening process. And of course, the screening process should be uh, in the same time held by artificial intelligence with smart methods of, of uh, diagnosis, um, uh, on-field uh, recognition of lesions and, and so on. So this, this is what I, I would do or what I will counsel um, uh, somebody who can make a difference in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one last question, which sounds like this. Do you recognize a niche in data science where Romania can perform better than other competing Western countries? And there's another question attached to this one, but I think we, we could focus on the first one. Okay. Uh, frankly, right now, uh, um, in order for Romania to have an, uh, uh, a particular Romanian data science or artificial intelligence niche, uh, niche, that would mean there is a regulatory system, there is financing in place, there, is, there are strategic uh, innovation uh, grant schemes that are focused in this particular area. So I don't think we can do that. I don't think we have uh, such niche. Uh, when it comes to uh, entrepreneurs, uh, such as um, Mr. Ivanov uh, or others, or even myself, uh, it, there is no boundary. So basically um, uh, you can do, you can develop the same neural models as a guy in uh, Stanford University is doing or in Baidu in China is doing. You can do the same thing, things and there is no potential uh, competitive advantage, local competitive advantage that can help you. So basically it's, it's free for all. Um, if we would like to have a particular niche where Romania could excel, then we need regulatory intervention. We need uh, focused finance, finance. We need uh, uh, focused finance through uh, innovation grant schemes and, and so on particular for artificial intelligence. And this is one of the subjects that European Commission has been focused, very focused in the past uh, six months. Uh, I think one, one month ago, the uh, EC, the European Commission president, uh, the lady came out on LinkedIn and everywhere and they said, uh, most of our uh, research money on the next uh, period will be spent on artificial intelligence. And they are trying to find niches where they can, where they can inject this money. And I think in Romania, uh, there is nothing rega with regard to this subject at this moment. I'm not, I don't think, I'm pretty sure. But we can follow others. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Ivanov, please. No, no it, perfectly right, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, from my experience in the last years, traveling a lot uh, until the pandemics, uh, seeing a lot of uh, accelerators, a lot of entities involved in research, uh, they are going far uh, uh, from from our situation because uh, they are uh, they have environments who who uh, permit that uh, to, to to have the innovation to attract money from European Union and yeah it's pretty clear yeah or for government of Canada or for government of of Quebec or from uh, I don't know United States National Science Foundation I mean they have the right environment and. Even though we are talking about uh, private incubators, 
they receive funding from, from government they, and they are subsidized by government. They have special taxes, they have special uh, financial mechanisms. So we don't. Linked to this, we have uh, an objection from the audience. Uh, Cesar says he doesn't understand why you believe more regulation from entities you previously stated um, do not understand the domain which would do not understand the domain would provide competitive advantage. Focused financing, yes, but more regulation, why? Mm, I didn't, sorry, I, I actually didn't say that we need more regulation. I said that we need more regulatory actions that would uh, create grant, uh, innovation grant uh, funding schemes. And we would need, uh, beside that, we would need uh, special uh, mm, subsidizing and special financial uh, mechanisms for uh, companies that are uh, in the area of artificial intelligence. We don't have that in Romania. So we don't need more taxes and more issues. We need less taxes, less issues and more help uh, and more regulatory help, help uh, in artificial intelligence and data science. Probably my answer wasn't clear enough. Cesar said, thank you. Okay, there are no other questions. Um, I have some questions, uh, Beatrice, because I have them on the uh, private chat as well, from Facebook, 360 Think Tank. Uh, what are you most proud of when it comes to your work as a data scientist? And um, Okay, so, um, unfortunately, uh, due to the fact that um, I'm bound by confidentiality rules. I cannot exactly say what I'm most, uh, uh, most proud about uh, in terms of technology, but I, I will say that I'm very proud of uh, having a, a very good team in the company that I work for. Uh, and uh, I have the, um, you know, uh, I had the privilege of, of forming and shaping up some of them. So this is uh, one of the uh, most important things for me as a data scientist, as well as uh, I had the, the privilege of working with very bright students uh, in the masters of, uh, for, uh, of intelli artificial intelligence and computer science in Polytechnic University. And I had the privilege of giving them uh, um, advice and give it and shaping them for potential data scientists. So uh, this is what I could uh, publicly say without any confidentiality breach. Thank you very much. Definitely confidentiality is, uh, is very critically important. Um, so um, before wrapping up, I would like to, to ask each one of you to state a short conclusion on that today's session. Yeah, uh, my conclusion yeah, is that uh, uh, it's extremely important the data science to be interpreted and uh, for sure it's critical. So we need a lot, a lot of uh, knowledge to implement it, these uh, discoveries from data science interpretation in practice. So we need to struggle more and you need to, to cover all the areas until we will implement it in the market. So this is an important thing. No, we cannot stay only on, on research. We cannot stay on the facilities where we develop MVPs. We need to have uh, proper partners who can take this knowledge and implement it in the practice. Thank you. Beatrice? I'm on the same page with uh, Mr. Ivanov. And I hope you enjoyed the session we had today and you learned from the insights that were shared with you. Thank you. Thank you, too. Um, OK, the last conclusion from your side. Oh, um, I hope I was, I was going to be overlooked. <laughs> OK, so uh, basically, I think I'm coming back to the same things that I previously mentioned a couple of times. Um, I think we need more attention from the uh, regulatory perspective. We need. Uh, the, um, the government to, to pay focused attention to the area of artificial intelligence and data science, not innovation in general, and not treat artificial intelligence as a simple computer and tech related subject. 
I think this is a very big mistake, and this is the mistake that European Commission did uh, six, seven years ago. And the, the right now, they are trying to focus entirely on uh, on, on artificial intelligence with specific uh, focus in, in, in this area. And this is, I think, very important for our country. And uh, on the other hand, I would like, I would love to see more and more uh, young uh, engineers and young scientists and young developers and uh, young people going on the path of data science and, uh, and having the right expectations. Yes, definitely. I think from my perspective as well, having more data scientists in Romania would, would position our country as a key player in Europe and at global level as well. Um, I am also happy, as, a, as a, my conclusion, let's say, I'm also happy to find out that uh, Romania has not last, uh, lost the start in becoming a respected player in data science applied in healthcare. But still, there are a lot of things to be done from a regulatory perspective. And still, yes, data privacy is still a challenge and a potential issue until it will be solved, totally. Um, and also that data understanding is more important than building the right model and so on. But it seems, at least for me, that the data science uh, job role is, is an amazing uh, uh, journey. And it's definitely not only interesting, but it drives constant innovation. So therefore, uh, for me, it's uh, just a conclusion that becoming a data scientist is the key when you want to decide what you want to become uh, as a profession. So thank you very much, everybody. I really hope that you enjoyed the session. You'll find the recording on the 360 Think Tank page. Um, have a lovely day ahead and a lovely weekend. It was awesome to be with all of you here today. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.